Good evening. I'm delighted to welcome you to our annual lecture this evening for York Human Rights City Network. My name is Marilyn Crawshaw and I'm a member of the executive of York Human Rights City Network. I'm going to start with giving you a little background. York declared itself a human rights city in April 2017 and in doing so it joined a growing number of such cities around the world but was the first in the UK to do so. The declaration followed several years in which a growing number of individuals and organisations had been meeting with the aim of developing systems and structures to make human rights real at a local level. Now, as you may know, the policy frameworks for human rights are set at international and national levels, and yet it is at the local level that human rights become most relevant to citizens. So we asked the people of York online and in the streets what they considered to be the key human rights for the city and we adopted their top five. The right to housing, the right to a decent standard of living, to education, to health and social care and to equality and non-discrimination. <clears throat> and eventually we, or rather the Lord Mayor of York in their role as the first citizen of York, were ready to make the declaration with the full support of all the political parties in the city. And the declaration reflects our passion about the need for good, strong attention to be paid to respecting human rights and the value that can come with adopting human rights approaches to policies and practices. And here's a synopsis of what the formal declaration says. And do have a look at the whole declaration on our website. But what we said was, in becoming a human rights city, York embraces a vision of a vibrant, diverse, fair and safe community built on the foundations of universal human rights. But importantly, it also says that this declaration marks an ambition, a significant point in a journey, not a final dis destination. We haven't got it all right yet. And we have three main objectives to encourage practitioners and policymakers across the city to use human rights law, practices, principles and approaches to guide their work, to raise public awareness and generate debate about human rights issues, like I hope we're going to do this evening, and to mobilise human rights to provide protection for vulnerable groups, both locally and as a form of international solidarity. Now, we are all too well aware of the complexity of the task not least because it needs all of us to improve our understanding of what human rights means in everyday language if we are to successfully apply them in our work or press for our rights to be respected. And we now have some specific vehicles in York for working towards our vision. The York Human Rights City Network brings together organisations predominantly from the civil society sector that represent those five key human rights that I, I mentioned, and, and colleagues from the statutory sector. Among many other activities, we produce an annual report with evidence of how the city is doing on each of those five areas of human rights. And then two years ago, the Council set up a Human Rights and Equalities Board, which also brings together organisations, but with a dual remit. Firstly, to set up multi-agency task forces to tackle specific areas where York is underperforming and secondly to encourage and support the Council to incorporate human rights thinking into all its policies and practices. I encourage you to check out our website, sign up to our mailing list and to get in touch and get involved. And I'm now going to hand over to Paul Grady I hope we'll turn on his camera and microphone, the Director of the Centre of Applied Human Rights at the University of York, who are a core member of York Human Rights City Network and who is going to chair the rest of the evening. Enjoy it. A very good evening from me as well and welcome to the Summer 2021 Open Lectures brought to you by the University of York. As Marilyn says, my name is Paul Grady, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's event. First, a few technical notes. Should you have any issues, such as with Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. 
live captioning is switched on. If you'd like to switch it off, you can do so via the closed captions or live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. The live captioning is auto captioning and so may not always capture exactly what is said as those of us who have been recording lectures throughout the year have learned to our cost. We have two British Sign Language interpreters, Claire and Jenny, who will remain on screen throughout the event. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it again on YouTube in the next few days and to share it with friends and networks who may be interested. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, Professor Alan Miller, to give the annual human rights lecture hosted by the York Human Rights City Network. Alan is Professor of Practice in Human Rights at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow and the independent co-chair of Scotland's National Task Force for Human Rights Leadership. He's also a long-standing champion of national human rights commissions, having chaired the Scottish Human Rights Commission for two terms and played an important role supporting human rights commissions throughout Europe and globally. As I'm sure you know, the title of tonight's talk is Human Rights Leadership, Local, National and International. As the first and to date only human rights city in England, we sometimes feel somewhat lonely and besieged by political developments. So it's been inspiring for me this week to look north and to review some of the materials from Scotland, both because they resonate with some of the things that we've been trying to do in York, but also because they provide new inspiration and ideas for the future. In terms of commonalities, I was struck that the work on housing in Leith in Edinburgh felt very close to the community voices work that we've been doing in the city for a number of years. It's framed explicitly in terms of supporting ordinary people to name the change that they want to see, to set the agenda for their own change. Using human rights instruments like documentation, monitoring, indicators, to shape the advocacy that will bring about that change. More broadly, I felt that there was a shared concern with making all rights real for all people. In Leith, the focus was on everyday issues, such as heating and dampness in properties, and we've shared that focus on everyday concerns in our work in York. In terms of areas of difference and potential learning, there are several. I was struck by the emphasis on dignity in much of the literature on Scotland, which isn't a term we've used a great deal within York, although we've discussed a lot how to frame human rights messages. Perhaps dignity is, is a term that we should use more. I was struck by the ambition of particularly the 2021 National Task Force for Human Rights Leadership Report which recommends the statutory recognition, not just of the Human Rights Act, but of a raft of UN treaties and rights within Scotland. We've talked in York of the value and indeed the meaning of working more explicitly with international legal instruments. Perhaps this is something to which we should return. And finally, the concept of leadership. In Scotland, there's a very clear commitment to demonstrate leadership at all levels that are highlighted in the title of the talk today, the local, the national and the international. At the Centre for Applied Human Rights where I'm based, we've done some work on leadership in relation to human rights defenders at risk and the challenges they face from shrinking civic and political space. And York as a human rights city has sometimes been seen as a leader by other UK and European cities but it surely couldn't be a more timely moment for us to reflect on the meaning of human rights leadership, given the current challenges we face, Brexit, COVID-19 and more. So, as we've already mentioned, I think, the talk will last for around 30 minutes. It's possible, indeed, we would invite you 
to put questions in there's, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Please do put your questions uh, to Alan while he's talking. The incentive to do so earlier is that the earlier you put the questions in, the more likely they are to be um, presented to Alan to address. So please get your questions in early. Um, without further ado, uh, let me once again welcome Alan, thank him for joining us. I'll invite him to put his camera on um, and the talk will now begin. Thank you very much indeed. Well, can I um, thank you, Paul, for your very kind um, introduction. And uh, can I right at the outset say I, I completely share your, your feelings of solidarity that we have to um, take forward on both sides of the border um, in the context of promoting human rights. So uh, thank you um, and to the university and indeed the city for inviting me to, um, to join you this evening and, and hello to everyone um, who's on uh, this call. I don't know how many calls uh, like this you have done over the last few months. Um, there have been far, far too many uh, for us all, I'm sure. And we look forward to actually um, meeting each other uh, in more normal uh, times. Um, I very much welcome um, the opportunity and the thought given to invite um, someone coming from uh, Scotland, because I think this is an ideal opportunity and, and a, a very appropriate time um, that this is not just a one-off event, but hopefully will open up a conversation uh, between uh, those of us in Scotland uh, and those of you in what is an historic uh, city uh, and, of course, the UK's first um, human rights city. So firstly, let me congratulate um, all of you who have been involved and, and are involved in this human rights city initiative. Um, I very much welcome it. Um, particularly its public participatory process uh, and the role played by civil society, which I think is something that we have in common in, in the work that we're carrying out um, uh, in our different contexts. Of course, like all human rights initiatives, it, it's uh, clearly a work in progress, as Marilyn said at the outset. Um, but with that approach taken of, of public participation and, and the public determining their priorities, and very interesting to hear that the they really were economic and social rights, which I, th I think is very, very significant um, in York. Um, I, th I think with that approach, you know, I look forward to seeing further progress in, in the years to come uh, from your initiative. Uh, and, and from a broader perspective, um, including but not only a, a Scottish perspective, it, it's a very welcome initiative um, because it's very important that, that all who support human rights um, get on the front foot um, in these times. And that may be difficult um, in other contexts, but if you can do it in your city uh, and begin the work there and get on the front foot, uh, that's a very, very important um, contribution uh, because cities are on the front line um, all over the world um, as regards um, the climate emergency, uh, migration, homelessness, uh, and many other issues. Uh, and you and York are setting an example and encouraging others to, to look towards you and, and to um, build upon what you have started. Cities also, however, um, are not just something in and of themselves, but they have an important relationship um, uh, with other uh, actors, uh, for example, uh, national governments, um, and can play an important role in, in, in leading, by example, uh, mobilizing public opinion in support of a human rights-based approach, uh, which can be taken up and, and shown to be working um, as an example and, and can be taken up at uh, regional, national and, and indeed international levels. So um, I, I'm very pleased to, to share with you some examples of efforts in and by Scotland to, to take up this shared responsibility of human rights leadership uh, and, and give you some examples at a local national uh, and international level uh, and then hopefully you know we can have a conversation um, afterwards so uh, let me begin in the local um, in a housing project in leith in edinburgh um, a link i think is going to appear on the the chat box which will hopefully you'll have some opportunity uh, you know after this um, zoom event that you can go and, and there's a short um package of films which uh, very well share the experience of the, the human rights project in Leith uh, and some of the, the lessons that can be learned, which, which uh, Paul uh, referred to. Uh, 
but let me tell you the story. Um, uh, it began um, when, when I was uh, elected by the Scottish Parliament uh, as the inaugural chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, which the Parliament had just established. Um, and I was given a congratulatory call by a friend and colleague of mine, Mary Robinson, who is the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, and she said, well done, Alan, um, you know, Parliament made a good choice, um, ha ha. Um, do you know the first thing you should do now that you're in this uh, post, you should uh, leave Scotland uh, and take yourself to Belfast um, and go to a, a housing estate called the Seven Towers. Um, because very good work's been done there and, and you should learn from it uh, and think about doing something in Scotland like that. Um, so with Mary, you, you don't second guess, um, you, you, you do it and I did it and I went over and introduced myself there. Uh, and there was a, an NGO, some of you may have heard of it, um, it's commonly referred to as PPR, uh, Participation and Practice of Rights. And they were doing very interesting work in the Seven Towers, and I got to know them and, and a great deal of respect for them. Uh, and then when I was back in Scotland and, and involved in, in leading the work of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, it came to my attention that there were really appalling housing conditions in, in a part of Leith in Edinburgh, um, which you know wasn't unique by any means. But what was very interesting was that there was some appetite amongst the tenants that this was no longer tolerable and that something had to be done about it. And so uh, I took the opportunity of, of inviting over um, to Scotland um, this NGO from Belfast um, and, and the Commission met with them and with some of the tenants from the housing project and just began to explore uh, what we might do in Leith. Um, one of the starting points was empowering the tenants to see themselves not as the passive recipients of uh, inadequate public services and, and, and appalling housing conditions, but as rights holders, um, because under the international covenants of, of economic, social and cultural rights, um, there was the right to adequate housing. Uh, and so they should see themselves in this way, uh, because there were obligations uh, on uh, the authorities to uh, comply with that right to adequate housing, even though it wasn't in the law, it was an international obligation. So a bit of a stretch, but nevertheless, uh, a stretch and, and, and a connection worth making. So the tenants became very empowered and then let a process which they led themselves of going amongst themselves um, and completing a, a questionnaire, a survey, just asking people uh, to list the priorities of things that needed done to improve housing and living conditions on an everyday basis. Uh, and that was done. And, and it, you know, in many respects, it wasn't huge, big things. It was very, very daily, practical, meaningful things like um, nobody from the city will come and clean up all the pigeon droppings that our kids are inhaling and digesting and uh, causing health problems. Um, there is some antisocial behavior in, in the playgrounds for the kids uh, and constantly there's, there's garbage and broken glass and, and the kids can't be allowed by their parents to go and play there. Um, or some of the lifts will break down regularly uh, and they won't get fixed for days uh, and so you have single mums more or less trapped um, in some of the floors because there's no, um, no way out that they can manage in all the circumstances. So uh, along with the dampness and, 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 and all of the other you know, housing conditions that you might well be familiar with. So that then led to a process of engagement between the tenants and the city, but with a definite power shift in that the, the tenants were saying, we're not just gonna sit here and listen to what you may or may not do with us and how tight the budgets are and all of that. We have a right to adequate housing we know that's not going to be a panacea that will be delivered overnight, but we want a plan that we can agree with you uh, as to what is going to be done with what priorities and, and resources allocated over a period of time. Um, and it will have the maximum benefit for us because it will be us that's saying how these resources should be uh, spent. And we will monitor the progress through indicators about 
uh, to what extent our living conditions are being improved uh, as this goes forward. So there, there was a bit of to and fro for a while uh, between the city council and the tenants, um, but um, the city did respond and serious investment was made in the project um, along the lines that the tenants were um, calling for. Uh, and this resulted um, in not only improving the standard of the housing uh, conditions, but, but lifted the whole morale uh, of the community. Um, and it, it resulted in an improvement to physical and mental health. Um, it resulted in much more solidarity within the community. Um, and was one of those sort of gold dust examples of where a human rights based approach had demonstrably improved people's lives. And um, significantly, it, it also resulted in the establishment of a sort of Scottish PPR, um, really just recently um, now in operation, uh, called uh, Making Rights Real. Uh, and, and this is going to um, you know, ignite other sparks around Scotland and, and, and develop and test similar uh, human rights based approaches, uh, learning the lessons from the Leith project, which, which has gained as a national and, and international attention for, for its significance. Um, let me now share with you um, at a national level, some interesting steps that are being taken to, to demonstrate human rights leadership. Uh, next, uh, week will be the Scottish election, um, which will obviously vote in a new parliament, um, but it is extremely likely that uh, the government that will be elected um, will be the, the present government, it will be returned to power, uh, and there is going to then be a bill introduced into the Scottish parliament to establish a new legal human rights framework uh, for Scotland. Uh, this will build upon the Human Rights Act, but will go much, much further than that uh, and include, for example, the incorporation of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So that provides the right to an adequate standard of living, including food, housing, the continuous improvement of, of living conditions, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, uh, the right to social security and the right to take part in cultural life. And then to ensure that there is equal and full enjoyment uh, to these rights and that nobody is left behind, uh, there will also be incorporated other key UN human rights treaties, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, uh, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, uh, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Also in recognition of the, the climate crisis, there will be a right to a healthy environment as part of this framework. And additionally, specific rights for older people uh, and equality rights for LGBTI people. Uh, how, how and why did this come about? Um, it was, as I said earlier, it was about very much getting on the front foot um, in Scotland over a, a period of time. And I think there were three key contributory factors uh, very briefly. One was you know, we had had about 20 years of devolution, the existence of the Scottish Parliament um, since um, just before the end of uh, 1998, 1999. And so it was time to take stock. Um, we'd had the Human Rights Act, um, we'd had the Equality Act for a, a significant period of that. Um, and we took stock of what we uh, had been um, experiencing on that journey over 20 years. On the one hand, it had been very positive. Um, there was an increased um, confidence um, and ambition in Scotland from a human rights point of view. There was an increased internationalist uh, outlook uh, and there was consistent advocacy uh, of an internationalist outlook and for incorporation of UN treaties from the Scottish Human Rights Commission uh, and civil society. But there was also negative experience uh, on that last 20 years. Uh, and that was the decade of austerity uh, which had pointed to the, the lack of economic and social rights and the, uh, the inability of the Human Rights Act in and of itself to provide sufficient protection. The next thing that happened um, at that time then of taking stock was um, Brexit um, and the weakening of that um, existing human rights framework. And it provided an impetus to the need to have a new human rights framework. 
Uh, and then uh, COVID um, was the next um, big, big factor which provided the urgency um, to this mission of um, establishing a new human rights framework uh, and, and recognising um, that the ambition had to be scaled up even more than it had been before COVID in order to acknowledge the, the need to strengthen economic and social resilience, uh, the addressing of uh, structural inequalities that had been exposed, and addressing the underlying climate crisis, recognizing that the pandemic itself was a result of the interference with the natural environment. So the, the, the Scottish government established task force for, for human rights leadership, led a public participatory process um, to the extent you could um, sort of online, um, and it published its report last month on March the 12th. And again, I think there's a link that you'll, you'll get in the chat box. Uh, which would enable you to look at the report uh, and it has 30 recommendations. Um, these recommendations include all those rights um, that I had um, flagged up earlier, but also measures to ensure their effective implementation. Uh, so uh, real duties on public bodies to comply with these rights that are enforceable. Uh, the, um, the need for public participation in the implementation of the framework capacity building of public bodies that they were able to meet their uh, and perform the duties that would be given to them. The, the strengthening of access to justice for individuals and communities. Uh, and then the monitoring of the results of all of this. You know, was it making the, the intended impact in improving people's lives on an everyday basis? All 30 recommendations were accepted by the Scottish Government. Um, there will then be a bill. There was also cross-party support um, for this uh, project. Uh, there will be a bill in the Parliament's next session uh, and then a programme of uh, public participatory process and, and capacity building, um, et cetera. So um, by far the biggest step yet in Scotland's human rights journey, but, but very much the necessity of these times. And then finally, um, at an international level, um, Scotland's um, commitment to place this new framework at the heart of its post-COVID recovery um, to build back better uh, has been very warmly welcomed uh, internationally, um, including by, we had quite a, a significant number of uh, senior UN experts who contributed to the task force process and, and shared international best practice and, and experience with us. Um, there was also, um, significant at a, an international level and a lot of welcome in a couple of respects. And one was um, to, to include in the framework the right to a healthy environment um, is quite significant because it, it adds weight to a, a movement now within the UN and amongst member states that the UN itself formally adopt a right to a healthy environment in recognition of the, the climate crisis. And then secondly, by including a right um, for older persons um, within the framework was very much welcome because within the UN system, there is a process um, leading towards the next treaty to be drafted will be a UN treaty on the rights of older persons. So this national experience and conversation we had was something that the, you know, the independent expert on the rights of older persons in the UN participated in with us and, and very much picked up and is taking it forward as an example of this gathering momentum to have an international treaty. Um, and, and moreover, um, it sort of reaffirms Scotland's commitment to the international rules-based order and the international human rights framework, which has come under a lot of pressure in the last few years, uh, and also as a demonstration of the commitment to the achievement of the sustainable development goals, because through the implementation of of these uh, rights and the framework uh, that sort of and the and the SDGs they're, they're mutually uh, reinforcing. So in conclusion, um, I, I very much look forward to to this evening's conversation, um, which hopefully can, as I say, just be a beginning to a, an ongoing um, dialogue between yourselves and, and the efforts that we're making in Scotland to, to learn from each other. Uh, we, we live in an interdependent world. Uh, there, there, is, there is no alternative but to, to work together on all the big global issues. And, and in addition to that, uh, we, we share the same island um, 
So all the more reason to, um, to express the solidarity that we did at the outset uh, and to share and understand each other's uh, experiences um, and, and to celebrate the progress that um, each of us can make in the, uh, the work that we're both undertaking. So with that, um, I hope the, the interpreter has, uh, yeah, she finished before I have. <laughs> no, I'm not surprised. I think she's now going to pass over to a, a substitute for the, for the conversation we can now have. So I'll pass back to, um, to you, Paul. I think Shelley is joining us now. Welcome, Shelley. Um, thank you very much, Alan. And we've got plenty of time for questions and, um, and your answers. Um, so let me start with, there's a couple of questions um, from well, one from Mary Sherwood and one from Joe uh, Michelli. So thank you both for those questions, which are really about, I suppose, the relationship between human rights and a human rights approach and, and other sort of uh, adjacent or similar approaches to social justice. So Mary's is about the difference between a human rights approach and a poverty truth commission. And Joe's is about I mean, noting the kind of reference to tenants moving from passive recipients to empowered citizens saying that resonates strongly with an asset based community development approach. Um, and I mean, again, it's something we we've, we've worked with a lot in York and, and in a sense tried to to grapple with and it's a challenge you often face is what is the value added. What's the specific value added of the human rights approach when compared to I mean, a, a number of other and other approaches. So would you would you be able to reflect a little bit on that, the specifics that you think a human rights approach, what specific contribution does it bring? Yeah, I, I mean, as, as a you know, lifelong human rights advocate, you, you, you become very, um, very proud of what human rights can do and, and the, the power that they can transfer from those in power to those disempowered. Um, but you also have to be very um, humble uh, and aware of the contribution that so many other um, disciplines um, can and, and need to make. Uh, so in the course of the, the task force process, for example, um, even though Scotland is a small country, um, we had to really begin to build bridges between the human rights community and the environmental community. Um, and, and the right to a healthy environment was the sort of bridge that we we built between the two communities, uh, because you know far too often we we operate in our own little um, silos and bubbles and, and don't see the commonality and respect the differences, uh, but uh, agree that this is a journey that we can work um, and walk together on. So the, the poverty truth commission that um, that Mary talks about. Uh, we have one um, in, in Scotland and it, it was very much um, a, a learning for, for us in the human rights community because it was, it was without saying so explicitly, um, implementing a human rights based approach. Uh, it, it was going out and learning from the lived experience of those suffering from uh, deprivation uh, and then trying to present that in policy um, for change. Uh, and what we found working with them is that human rights could add power if they could frame that experience of those who were suffering from deprivation in human rights terms. It sort of lifted it because then there were duties. Um, th this wasn't just a charitable appeal for a better deal. This was something that actually was a right and an obligation on the part of the authorities. Uh, and, and so that empowered uh, and gave that extra uh, dimension to the work of the Poverty Truth Commission. And, and we, of course, benefited from, from that direct um, contact with those with lived experience. Uh, and similarly, um, Joe's point about the, the asset-based approach, again, you know, there's so many similarities, I'm sure, that we have in our experience. In Scotland, too, in the health sector, um, the, the former chief medical officer in Scotland, uh, Professor Harry Burns, really promoted an asset-based approach to health inequalities. Um, and you know, his, his main and very influential sort of um, advocacy was don't do things to communities who are suffering from health inequalities. Uh, 
um, build on the assets that these communities themselves have, empower them in order because they are in the best position to know just how these inequalities can be most effectively tackled and, and what concrete improvements in their daily life and all the determinants of poor health. And it can be housing or lack of employment or, or addiction to various things. That, that holistic approach, uh, building on the, the resilience and the, the motivation of these communities to improve their lot, um, that's what the, the approach that government should take and, and not a top-down uh, patronizing attitude. And, and so there was a real commonality with a human rights-based approach there. And, and, and we had lots of conversations um, and you know, aligning our, our approaches to, to add power um, to one another. Uh, and so this new framework, uh, including the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health uh, is one of the fruits of, of that. So um, yeah, it's everyone has to do something and everyone can do something from whatever uh, discipline uh, they, they start out from. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, so that leads into, there's a couple of questions that are um, I think lead on quite nicely really about sort of methods really, the how in terms of rights-based approaches. Um, Ruth Potter, who's a member of the network, the Human Rights City Network, is asking about the key features of a participatory debate and approach to human rights at a local level. And Jay Heap, who's one of our students at the moment, is asking about the process. How do you get people to consider themselves rights holders and what does the process look like? Yeah, I could give you, um, I mean, good, good questions are, are really good. Um, I can give you a very concrete example of putting into practice a human rights based approach, um, again, which produced real results. Um, and that was um, at the Scottish Human Rights Commission, we, we um, advocate the panel approach, participation, accountability, non-discrimination, and power legality it comes from the UN development system. But putting that into practice, um, there was a very, very big problem in Scotland and, and shared in many other countries, um, regrettably, that hadn't been able to be cracked. Uh, and that was providing access to justice for victims of historic child abuse. And the government actually turned to the commission pretty much in desperation and said, we admit we can't, we just can't get this done properly. Um, you're always talking about a human rights based approach. You know, let's try that. Let's see if that can take us somewhere that we haven't got to before. So uh, we, we, we then uh, adopted um, what we call the FAIR approach. So the F is for the facts, the A is for analysis, the I for identification of the rights at stake, and the R for reviewing of what progress. And we put together a process which lasted about three years based on these FAIR sort of methodology. And we brought together for the first time ever, sitting around the same series of tables in, in a room, um, the victims of historic uh, child abuse, the survivors, sitting beside the representatives of those religious institutions or local authority bodies that had been responsible for the historic child abuse. And then we had independent experts. We had four Scottish government cabinet secretaries sitting there. And, and I, I chaired the, the initial event and, and said, today we're only going to listen to the victims of historic child abuse. No one else is going to actually speak, but we're just going to try and put ourselves in their shoes. The next time we meet, then other voices will be heard and brought into the conversation. And you could have heard a penny drop. It was a, a, a absolutely tense atmosphere as to, as to whether it would work at all. And it did, and they began to share their experiences. And you could just see the body language. This was the first time that many of these other people had actually been exposed to this reality. And then the next stage was then to say, right, so those are the facts that are, that are being brought to the table. What, what are the rights at issue here? What are the human rights at stake here? Uh, and we began to look at what they were. Uh, and then there was an agreement um, that the next stage would be to the I to identify, therefore, who needs to do what within this human rights framework to provide access to justice. And a plan, an action plan was developed. And it included things like there should be um, a compensation scheme for, for survivors. Uh, 
there should be uh, an apology law go through the Scottish Parliament to enable churches and, and local authorities to make apologies without being held legally liable for doing that, but to acknowledge what had happened and, and uh, learn the lessons. There should be a national inquiry um, to, to learn the lessons and make sure this should never happen again. And, and there should be sort of memorials and acknowledgements um, recognized in what, what had happened. All of that was um, agreed by all the participants. Um, and then there was a process put in place that periodically uh, this body would, this, and we called it a human rights interaction. This, this process would be reconvened to take stock of what progress has been made. And I can say that um, all of those steps have been taken uh, either by the parliament or by the government or by the, the relevant institutions. And when we had the final meeting of that process uh, and the cabinet secretaries came back into the, the same room uh, one of them came up to me uh, and uh, before we started, he said, Alan, um, I don't know, I don't really understand this, but I, I can just sense that something big has happened here because these survivors are different people now from when I saw them, you know, a couple of years ago. And whatever, whatever this human rights based approach has done, I can see it myself. Um, so this is for real. And whatever is in that action plan, we are going to agree. Um, the cabinet secretary then who had to sign off the financial redress scheme um, was briefed by his officials to say, because he'd asked them, how many survivors are there? You know, what is the size of the budget that we're going to have to uh, find to provide compensation? And the official said, um, well, we don't know. You can't quantify it. It's, it. That's just the reality of the situation. We simply have to make it available and see who comes. And the cabinet secretary said, um, so I'm expected to go into cabinet and get the approval from my colleagues when I don't know what the size of the, what we're you know, setting ourselves up for here. And they say, well, yes, that, that's right. Okay, that's the right thing to do. That's what I'll do. And, and that's what was done. So that's that you know, empowering um, and inspiring effect of human rights was, um, was, was demonstrable um, uh, of all those who had participated in it. So that's, that's one of the examples of the methodology that uh, has been successfully used. Great, thank you. I mean, it's very useful, I think, to have a concrete example like that, isn't it, to flesh out the, the kind of impact that the rights-based approach can have. Um, um, Margie's got a question, which I guess in the way is about intersectionality and how human rights um, deals with and perhaps advances more intersectional um, social justice. It's about basically the housing situation is very hard for disabled people and their families. Would you be able to say how the human rights work in LEAF supported disabled equality, making sure that disabled people um, are empowered and not further marginalised? Yes, I, I think a couple of things, Margie. Um, one in LEAF and then um, what we're doing nationally with um, sort of scaling that up. Uh, you know, in Leith, when, when the, the survey went, was taken round all the doors by the tenants to find out what are the real everyday problems and, and what are the effective solutions, um, then those kinds of questions would come up. You know, if, if a disabled person wasn't able to get down the stairs uh, um, by themselves and the lift was broken and hadn't been fixed, you know, th this was a, a disproportionate impact on them that that able-bodied people would have been able to, um, you know, go down the stairs, uh, as an example. So that lived experience um, was then fed into the, the negotiations with the City Council to ensure that the housing conditions that were going to be improved through the resource allocation had to take into account the real lived experience of everyone in, in the project, which included obviously disabled people. Uh, and then when the task force at a national level was carrying out its public uh, engagement to determine you know, what rights should we be recommending go in this new um, statutory human rights framework for Scotland, this question of intersectionality um, was a very, very significant uh, feature of many, many conversations that we had, whether it was with um, disabled people or women or children uh, or, or black and ethnic minority uh, people, LGBTI, older people, it, it, it came up everywhere. 
Uh, and so one of the reasons that we recommended that not only do we incorporate the covenant on economic and social rights, which belong to everyone, but also the covenants on women's rights, on, on, on racial discrimination, on disability rights, they form part of a whole and they would ensure that the question of intersectionality could be effectively addressed by that integrated approach towards ensuring that nobody was left behind, which, which reflects the international experience. That's why these treaties were subsequently brought into being, because if you don't bring them into being and, and specifically acknowledge um, the reality that there will be those groups left behind otherwise, um, then you know, in Scotland we were sort of reflecting that, um, but putting them all into the framework at the, at the one time um, rather than subsequently. So yes, it's intersectionality was a, a very, very prominent feature. Great, thank you. Um, slightly different topic now. Uh, we've got a question from Philip, um, who I think maybe works for the York Museum's Trust. How can cultural institutions support human rights? Yeah, um, I mean, the, 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 the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which will be incorporated into this new framework, um, is, is going to therefore in, include the right to, uh, right to take part in cultural life. And that actually is one of the, the sort of most exciting areas because it, it's the least explored, I, I think, in developed countries globally. There's a lot more experience of what it has meant in, in being applied in developing countries. But so when we carried out our public engagement and, and we sort of you know, shared what the rights are within this covenant that we were thinking to recommend be incorporated. Um, th there wasn't the same sort of wealth of uh, information, advocacy, experience saying, well, this is what it could mean in, in, in our context. Where it did come up, uh, for example, however, was um, in the gypsy traveler community um, and, and the, the right to take part in that cultural life. And, the Gaelic language, some of the rural and island uh, communities. And then it also sort of came up when we were meeting with a lot of interfaith groups um, and, and they were talking about the impact of the COVID lockdown on places of worship and, and cultural and community centres in various faith communities, so Sikh, Muslim uh, and others, and how the lack of that ability to take part not only in the in the, the faith worship but simply the um the cultural dimension of the community of the faith community um, what was something that really was felt the most painfully by by many people and so that was a very interesting dimension cultural institutions i think too have a big role to play um, in the the black lives matter um, movement just now a, a big thing in scotland for example is um you know, and dealing with racism and bringing, bringing in the race UN convention. This is the time, to, I mean, it should have been done decades ago in the UK, but this is a time to do it because the consciousness in the public since George Floyd um, of the legacy of colonialism and imperialism um, and the lack of education and public awareness, which is now pouring out to not just in Scotland, in terms of you know, statutes, street names, etc. So, and the place for museums and libraries to be archives of that and to provide explanations for the historical context. Um, this is a whole conversation that has opened up and it's very timely that it, that can be linked with, with this new human rights framework as well. A nice question from Tamsin Mitchell. Um, Congratulations, Tamsin, on finishing your PhD. Um, uh, I'm going to paraphrase this, which is, um, it, what impact would independence have on um, human rights work in Scotland? Yeah, um, in the report, uh, you know, all the recommendations that we made were for the here and now, the, the, the reality of the current constitutional arrangements. Um, and, and the bill that will be introduced to the Scottish Parliament will reflect um, the limitations, quite frankly, of what the Scottish Parliament can do in terms of the legislation it is um, able to pass. So the, 
the impact of independence, as we, as we sort of made our reference to in the report, would be that um, the scope of the rights would be broadened. So the, we don't have powers, for example, in the area of immigration uh, or, or employment uh, or sort of macroeconomics, foreign policy. So the extent um, of and scope of the rights that could be contained in any new framework would be broadened. Also, they would be able to be um, entrenched, like constitutionally protected as part of a, a Bill of Rights, as part of a written constitution. Whereas even this new statutory framework that will be passed by the Scottish Parliament, uh, at the end of the day, is subject to the will of the Westminster Parliament. It, it, it can be appealed, it can be removed, as indeed could the Scottish Parliament. So it can't be entrenched in the way that a, a, you know, the, an understanding of a modern Bill of Rights would, um, would require it to be. So a, a lot of the work that's gone into developing this framework uh, could be further developed and broadened into a Bill of Rights as part of a written constitution. But the, the recommendations that we have made now are, are very much for the here and now. Thank you. One of the distinctions we find a lot in uh, work in cities is the distinction between where the idea comes primarily from the local authority. Um, we're discussing this idea with Swansea recently, where it's very much a local authority led initiative and where it comes from civil society. And in York, the campaign was led by civil society and community groups. Um, I've been seeing your reflections on that, but we have a question from Navina, who's from Canada. Um, and they're working as part of a civil society uh, sort of coalition, um, trying to advance rights with local government, have had some success with the right to housing, but are wanting to broaden the conversation to include more economic, social and cultural rights. And she's seeking your advice. Yes, um, I used to live in Canada. So um, thanks, Lavina. And um, I was in a webinar, in fact, last week with the, the former UN Special Rapporteur on the right to housing, who, as you know, is, is Canadian. And, and so she's the one you should, if you're not already, she's the one you should be asking and, and not me, because she's a real, um, real mover. Um, and uh, just linking that, however, with an, another event I was in a couple of weeks ago, looking at um, the right to housing, adequate housing. Uh, and there was a, a, a participant and a speaker, a fellow panelist from Wales, um, who was talking about the, the efforts in Wales uh, to introduce a, a right to housing. And I know the Canadian experience has, has actually been a very positive one. I think there's a, a lot of lessons that all the rest of us are, are learning. But the, um, the interesting thing from the sort of Wales-Scotland comparison on the right to housing and how that could be broadened was quite interesting. Uh, it's going to be in Wales, if it happens, a specific um, piece of legislation with a specific right, as I understand it, the right to housing. Whereas in Scotland, we are, you know, we're incorporating the international covenant on economic, social and cultural rights, within which there is the right to adequate standard of living, within which there is the right to adequate housing as one of the sort of conditions of, of being able to enjoy an adequate standard of living. So the, the two benefits, I think, of broadening it out from simply the right to housing and placing it in that context of the right to an adequate standard of living and the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, the right to social security, is that um, it's a much more integrated, holistic approach, recognizing that there are different dimensions and factors and determinants of your ability to enjoy human rights, and, and they're all interdependent and, and interrelated. So to, to hive one off by itself will have benefits, but there'll be limited benefits because of the, the way in which it's been done. And the other benefit of incorporating the, the, the covenant as a whole is that you then um, are part of that international human rights framework and accountability process so that um, where even, let's say we introduce this framework in Scotland, um, there will be scope for civil society bodies to bring parallel reports to the treaty body committee at the UN pointing out uh, the shortcomings, the lack of effective implementation of this right, uh, 
and that treaty body can then provide you know recommendations concluding observations that the Scottish government um, publicly would have to then um, you know, do its best to to implement so it gives that extra level of, of international accountability at the state level so uh, th th those are those are the ways in which we're trying to broaden out from from the right to housing by itself into that wider arena great thank you i'm going to try and squeeze in two more questions um the first one is from barbara and um, what if any opposition is there to a human rights approach in scotland um, yeah, thanks, Barbara. Very little. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I was chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission from 28 to 2016. And, you know, it wasn't all down to the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Civil society plays an enormous role. But I remember being sort of debriefed by the Parliament, the, the Human Rights Committee at the end of my term of office, as to, you know, where I thought things had gone during my period in, in office. And it was the, the popularization of a human rights based approach and how embedded it had become, um, you know, most civil society bodies were, were doing it. Um, many, many um, pieces of legislation were making specific reference to international human rights obligations in the public sector and in the Scottish government more and more departments were saying they were doing a human rights based approach trying to do a human rights based approach it doesn't really matter whether they were all you know bona fide but it had entered into the vocabulary and and it was the the default that if you weren't seen to be talking that way and trying to do things that way you weren't really part of the conversation um, so the very very broad support for human rights based approach and it, you know, it has entered into the um, the culture. There, there has been a definite culture development. Mm. It's it's a long way to go uh, yet, but um, it, it was quite remarkable how how quickly. Because I think there was a an existing readiness and, and sort of public political culture that was open uh, to that being being influenced by that process. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the phrase developing a culture of human rights has been used a lot, but is notoriously difficult to achieve, isn't it? But it yeah. sounds like you've made very significant progress in Scotland. So congratulations for that. I've saved this question for last. It's from John Gray, who has a long association with the centre, and it's about um, the individual qualities of leadership. Um, I wonder what you would say about human rights leadership at the individual level, what skills, qualities, attitudes do you see as important for leadership by individuals in the human rights context? Yeah, that's, that's a big question. Um, I, I would say if you don't have confidence in human rights yourself and actually feel it and live and breathe it and have that conviction, you will not be a leader. Um, if you don't then have the ability to make relevant human rights to the everyday living conditions of people, then you'll not influence them and you'll not mobilize public opinion and, and therefore you'll not be a leader. If you can't then navigate a journey forward, bringing into that journey people who come from different experiences, perspectives, uh, outlooks, um, but be able to bring them together on this common path, um, then you'll not be a leader because you can't, you can't do it by yourself. And the final one, I think, is, is humility, um, that you have to be respectful of the lived experience of people, be prepared to give up power to those that you are empowering uh, through advocacy of, of human rights. And you have to respect... Um, the, the culture, the traditions, the, the, the sort of way of life and the contribution that many other disciplines can make, be it environmental, be it scientific, be it economic. Um, so that's, that's the package, <laughs> I would think, from my experience. Well, I think that's a very um, uplifting and powerful way in which to finish. Um, my thanks personally, but I'm now going to hand over to um, Alison Simmons, who will give a formal vote of thanks to you, Alan. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'd like to thank Alan for beaming in from Scotland uh, this evening to join us and giving us such food for thought.
my big takeaway is how human rights approach adds power. Uh, and it was really useful to hear the example of how um, a human rights based approach led to citizens feeling empowered. And that gave them the ability to bring about change to improve their lives. So that's something we'll, we'll take on board in York. Um, so we will continue to look at human rights approach in York. Um, as we address some of the issues um, faced by some of our citizens, um, particularly in the development of our uh, Poverty Truth Commission. So we've got lots of challenges, but uh, we're all talking the same language. We're all talking about power, um, human rights. It's, it's just really reassuring that we're all on the same page. So thank you for being uh, so inspirational um, this evening. And I want to thank um, everyone for joining us. That is the end of the discussion for this evening. I hope you've been inspired as much as I have, and I wish you a happy end of the evening to everyone. Thank you.